This episode was made possible by ExpressVPN. Start browsing the web securely with three months free by going to expressvpn.com slash MMI. On this episode of Meet My Inspiration, I talk with Sieve Harstad. Sieve is on an epic mission. She is aiming to become the first person ever to climb the highest mountain on every continent, which she has already done, climb the highest volcano on every continent, which she's nearly done, and to visit both the North and South Poles. After hearing her inspiring and harrowing tales from going blind while standing atop Mount Everest, to her success in the corporate world and as an entrepreneur, I think everyone will agree that she will undoubtedly succeed to become the first person ever to achieve such an amazing feat. And now, please welcome Sieve Harstad. Uh, hey, Sieve, thanks a lot for joining me on Meet My Inspiration. Let's begin with you sharing a quick overview of your background and what you're doing now. Yeah, my, my background is that um, I have a master in business uh, and administration, and I've uh, been working in corporate and as a management consultant, being a leader, and yeah, a lot of that stuff. And today I have my own company, and I do t- talks for corporates and take people on trips around the world, and also a lot of other things, you know, trainings, building teams, and yeah, exciting things. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we'll get into that in a little bit more detail later on, but um, let's go back to your, your early life. So where did you grow up and what kind of upbringing did you have? Well, I come from the west coast of Norway and I grew up in a small village called Battenfjord. Uh, it's one of those Norwegian fjords where you have the mountains around the, the valley. And um, my mom and dad, they were... Um, my mom was working for the dentist and my mom, that father was an entrepreneur, but also we had a small farm with sheep and uh, my grandparents were also entrepreneurs. So I learned really early in life that if you put your efforts in, you can get results and earn money from it and that anything is possible if you believe you can do things. That's a fantastic lesson to learn at a young age. Um, it is. Your father was an entrepreneur. Your grandparents were both entrepreneurs? I'd say my, my grandmother, she was sewing things for people and she was cooking for big parties, weddings, stuff like that. And also working at my grandfather's factory a little bit. So, so your grandfather had a factory and your father, you said you, you grew up on a, or you had a farm or maybe you grew up on a farm. What else mm-hmm. was your father involved in? He had his own company as well. So he was, um, you know, building houses and also he was making like a very niche thing for freeze doors for ships. Okay. Well, I guess it's necessary where you guys were at the time. Um, but anyway, you know, if you have big ships and they, for instance, do fishing, they need like freeze doors for the cool rooms and the freezers and stuff. So. Sure. Good, good, good. Mm-hmm. Well, so entrepreneurship uh, runs in the family. That's fantastic. Um, yeah. So when you were growing up, who did you look up to? Who was a role model for you? I think as a kid, you know, it was my grandmother because she was doing so many fun things. And then in my teens, uh, it was my aunt because I, she had a great job in an insurance company and a BMW and all that. So as a teenager, that was like something that looks, looked nice. You, you looked up to her because she was a successful business person. Yeah. Good. Yeah. You kind of followed in her footsteps to, to some degree. Um, well, an important piece of your story is climbing, um, a big part of mm-hmm. your life, I think. Um, yeah. When did you begin climbing? It's something that has developed over the years and and growing up, uh, of course, in the west coast of Norway, we have mountains all around and we were skiing and having a mountain cabin and also getting our sheep down from the mountains in the autumn was was a job that I, in my teens, didn't like too much, but we did it, you know, and then uh, as I got older, I started doing mountaineering, mostly tracking with friends. Uh, and it was first like in 2004, where I climbed the highest peak in Costa Rica. 
uh, Krista Friend said, you know, if you climb there, you can see both the Pacific and the Caribbean on the same time on a clear day. So that was like, oh, let's do that. And then from there, it kind of, you know, grew and developed. So you, you did your first kind of big climb in Costa Rica. How high was that? I'm curious. 3,800 meters. So for you, that's pretty, pretty small stuff, I guess, right? Now it is, but at the time I never, you know, the highest peak of Norway is 2,400. So, uh, it's, so it was <laughs> higher than anything you'd yeah. at the time. Was it, yeah, was it very absolutely. technical? No, no, it's more like a track. Uh -huh. But you know, for us, the altitude was challenging. We didn't know much about it then because we didn't know much. We did a lot of mistakes that we learned a lot from. So I was going to ask you when the climbing bug bit you, but I think you kind of explained that already. Um, it wasn't a specific well, actually, moment. Yeah, sorry. Well, it, it was actually, because that was like something that wanted me to do more. And, and um, the year after I went to Peru to do the Inca Trail. Mm. Uh, but before we did that, we went into the jungle in Amazon and coming to the mountain, it was like, oh my goodness, I'm home because the jungle is for sure not for me, you know? It sounds like- in Go ahead. Sorry. And also another thing is that after that, I was like so eager to find somebody that could join me to climb Kilimanjaro. And I tried, I think for two years and like nobody wanted to go. So I was like, oh my goodness, you know, in the end I was thinking, I'm just going to do it. And I was ready to sign up. And then all the trips for that year was fully booked. So I was like, you are kidding me because I've been wanting to do that so long. And in the end, I, I ended up to go to Aconcagua instead. Uh, and I'd say that that was really when I got the bug, you know, because achieving that, uh, that did something to me. And, and the passion has been like growing, growing ever since that. Where, where is that exactly? That is the highest peak in South America. <clears throat> and, and it is, I would say, I would never recommend anybody to go there as their first climb, but I didn't know better and nobody told me, not even the company who organized it. So I was like, you know, <laughs> happy go lucky, but actually I, I, I wasn't really because I, I did prepare really well and I had a really good PT that knew a lot about it. So thanks to him, I had the strength and everything I needed when I got there. So was it a big challenge for you at the time? Yeah, I'd say, yeah, absolutely. Because it's almost 7,000 meters mm -hmm. high. Mm -hmm. So. What, what exactly was the big challenge for you? Was it fear? Was it physically challenging? Was it mentally challenging? What was the big challenge for you in getting to that first high peak of yours? I think that um, before I went, it was all the unknowns. Uh, I really wanted to be strong enough because I never, you know, been on a that long trip. It was three weeks and to carry this heavy, heavy backpacks because we didn't have any porters on that mountain. And and um, then on the mountain itself, we had some challenges because our main guide got altitude or he actually got pneumonia. So we had to go down on the mountain and a lot of things happened. So we were in a team of 10 clients there and in the end it was me and one other guy that managed to summit so all, for me that the, was like all the other people did not summit mm -hmm. <laughs> what was the reason out of 10 well, people only uh, one or two made it yeah and the re one of the reasons was when the guy the the main guy got sick uh, we ended up in like a camp in between camp one and two and the person that took over the responsibility decided we, we were going to do the summit push from there. That was 1500 meters summit push uh, on any mountain. It's normally 1000. So that was so much longer than normal. And they did a lot of mistakes. One of them was that they started too late. Uh, they took the wrong road or and it's not a road it's like a track mm -hmm. so we ended up taking much longer than normal and people got sick and lost motivation and, and all the things kind of crumbling from our team 
Um, not you. So, not me and not the one of the other guys. We were like, I just said to him at one point when there were only the two of us left, and I just said to him, the two of us are going to go to the summit. <laughs> you don't quit now. <laughs> and we did it. And that was one yeah. of your first real climbs. Um, yeah. Where did you get the confidence to say, we're going to do it. We're going to push. All these other people are sick or tired, but not me. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to do it. And you didn't really have much experience in doing something like that. Where do you think the confidence came that, that you were going to be capable to, to get up there and to get, get back down safely as well? Well, I, I think that I, I just was so extremely motivated to do it. So I think uh, that was a big part of it because you never will reach a summit of a mountain if you kind of would like to do it. You really need to want it because it's not going to be sunshine and flowers. You know, it's going to be tough. So, so, so uh, I think I really wanted it. Uh, and then I have to say, maybe the last 300 meters, I was so tired, but I, I kept thinking, you know, I can go to that next rock and then to the next rock and avoiding thinking it's so far. Yeah, I just I break it thought I could do this. Yeah. Basically how you eat a big elephant, <laughs> take a piece at a time. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, no. I'm, I'm, would, we don't do that. <laughs> uh, I'm curious. Um, so for people who don't climb or climb extreme to the heights that you do, I guess, you just mentioned that it's challenging. It's mm -hmm. exhausting. It could be scary at times. Your life could be in danger. Why do it again and again and again? What's, what's the appeal? What's the reward for all of that suffering? For me, I think it, it is the challenge and also the feeling I get when I make it to, to actually achieve it. Uh, that is incredible for me personally. Um, but it is uh, interesting because I didn't, if you asked me 15 years ago, if I were going to climb Everest, I would have thought you were crazy because that was never my goal. But I, and so I didn't never have any big climbers as my, um, you know, role models or anything. But, but I remember um, there was a Norwegian Everest expedition in 1985, the first Norwegian Everest expedition. And, and when they got back, uh, the expedition leader, he was interviewed and, and they said to him, so why did you do it? And he said, uh, those who do understand need no explanation and for those who don't understand no explanation is good enough and and i like to quote that because it really is like that i like that well it explains it, it explains it for sure um so you just mentioned that when you prior to becoming a climber you didn't really have too many role models but what about as you were kind of developing as a climber maybe you climbed your first summit Maybe you came across some people, you met some people, you started reading books, I don't know. Um, was there somebody in the climbing world that inspired you to do more? Yeah, I had actually a friend who, who is a guide and um, he inspired me and challenged me to do more and more. So uh, I went climbing with him several times and uh, you know, he, he all the time said, well, you should try this next and you should do this. And so that's, that was a good inspiration. And I learned a lot from him. And who, who was that? His name is Hovar. He's from he was Norway. Just a, a climbing partner, yes? Yeah, or he was the guide who organized a lot of trips and yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Okay. Um, so yeah. you, you mentioned the, um, the first big climb that you did. You said it was the tallest um, mountain in South America, and I guess that's one of the seven summits, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could you could you explain what the seven summits are for those that don't know? Yeah, uh, it is the highest peak on each on the seven continents. So North America, South America, Antarctica, Europe, South America, no Africa, I mean, 
uh, Asia, and, and then there is Oceania. Uh, there's a little bit of a discussion around it because the first guy who made the seven summit list, he didn't do all of Oceania, he only did Australia. Uh -huh. uh, so there is like two lists of which are the seven summits. Okay, and you have achieved um, the seven summits. Um, mm -hmm. So you already told us which your, your first of the seven summits was. Um, yeah. So of those seven, which do you think was the easiest? I'm sure none, none of them are easy, but which one was the easiest? I'd say Kilimanjaro. Kilimanjaro. Um, yeah. Where is Kilimanjaro for those that don't know? Yeah, that is in Africa. It's the highest peak in Africa. Um, and, and I'd really say if somebody would like to try high altitude, that is a really good peak to, to test yourself and to see how your body is reacting to the altitude and, and to learn. It's, it's essentially um, a challenging hike. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, it is. It's not really climbing, but, but you get up to 5,895 meters. Yeah. So, so it's, a, it's a good challenging height. Yeah, not easy, but of the seven, certainly uh, one of the easier ones. Um, yeah. what, what about, in your opinion, the most challenging of the seven? Well, I think for most people, I'd say Everest for sure. And, and for me, absolutely, because I had two big incidents connected to it. Uh, when I went uh, in 2015, we experienced uh, Nepal's big earthquake, uh, 7.9 on the Richter scale. So that was something. And then I went back into 2016 and lost my vision on the summit. So yeah. big challenge. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's okay. Well, let's talk about Mount Everest. Obviously, it's such an iconic place. Uh, and probably the most well-known of the seven summits. Could you walk mm -hmm. us through in a bit more detail um, about your experience of getting to the summit and making it back down safely to become the first Norwegian woman uh, to climb Mount Everest from the Nepali side? Yeah. I think I actually have to take you back about eight years ago because I was still in corporate. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, I was head of HR in the finance industry. Mm -hmm. and, and I had uh, managed to find a solution to that bird climbing challenge. Um, at the time, I was working a lot uh, and coming from management consulting, I was used to that. However, part of the work environment there was a bit toxic. So on Monday morning there, I was on my way to the bus to go to work. And almost at the bus stop, I thought what my friends had told me over the weekend that I shouldn't go to work, that I should call my doctor. So I was thinking, oh, okay, maybe I should not go to work. So I went back up and almost home. I was thinking, oh, come on, see, of course you're going to go to work. And I went down again and I ended up going up and down the road four or five times. And I was like, okay, this is for sure not good. So I ended up calling my doctor and I had a severe burnout because I didn't sleep, I had lost my concentration, so I couldn't read a book if my life depended on it, and my short-term memory was gone, and, and my blood pressure was so high that it was really dangerous for me to exercise, you know? And around the same time, I was invited to join an Everest expedition, and I not only said yes to that, but ended up as the expedition leader as well. So for me to, to get healthy from that burnout and then get ready for Everest, uh, Everest actually became the big reason for me to become healthy again, mm. to, so that I could go climbing. Uh, and it was a tough job, but I managed to get ready for it in the spring of 2015, you know? And then a very long story short, uh, the 25th of April, we experienced this massive earthquake of 7.9 on Richter scale. And we also barely escaped a big rockfall. So for where, us, where, like- Where were you at the time? We were climbing a peak called Loboche East. Uh, that is 6,200 as a preparation, acclimatizing. 
And, and you know, in, in just seconds, everything changed. Everything we worked for and planned for changed. And, and in Nepal itself, you know, 9,000 people died, 1 million lost their house. And in Everest Base Camp, 20 people died. And I think 70 was severely injured. Uh, our camp was hit. So some of our tents was like knocked to the ground, not by the earthquake, but the earthquake like triggered an avalanche that yeah. hit base camp and caused yeah. all this damage. And and we were, you know, about one day walk from Everest Base Camp. And because of the earthquake, all mobile and Wi-Fi, everything was down. So it took us actually quite a bit of time to get an overview of the situation and understand, you know, the severity of what we had experienced. Did obviously when we did you knew that there was an earthquake, of course, right? Oh yeah, you, you hardly can stand on your feet when it's wow. that out strength of it, you know? Yeah, that's a huge earthquake. It was, and, and for us it was easy to cancel when we understood what was happening. And, and also for the Sherpas, they, they needed, of course, to go home to their family in that mm -hmm. situation, you know? But, but I was so grateful that nobody I knew was hurt. There was a few people I know that lost their house, but, the, but that's and at that situation. That's just materialistic things, you know? Mm -hmm. so, and then, that, that, so let me, let me interrupt for just a moment. Um, yeah. So that first, the first expedition had to be canceled due to the mm -hmm. huge earthquake, obviously. Um, and then I think you did return a couple of years later, but yeah. I want to go back to, um, you kind of overworking yourself and burnout, as you called it. Um, that was just a direct effect of working too much, working too hard, not taking care of yourself. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Um, being a climber, you, you seem like somebody that would be focused on taking care of your health and taking care of yourself physically. Um, did you just lose sight of that because of your career ambitions? I think it was a specific situation in that workplace because somebody else was sick and I was thinking, oh, I can help out, you know. Um, and and I, I, it came to a point where my mind and my body didn't agree on things. Because mm. I, in my mind, I, I was thinking you know, I can do a little bit more and a little bit more, you know, how it goes sometimes. And, and I, my body have given me a lot of signals, but I had ignored them. So a part of that journey of getting sick was coming back to a place where I actually do listen to my body and take all the signals it gave me because mm -hmm. it does give us signals. But when we ignore them, like I did, uh, you will at the end get a message you cannot miss, you know? Mm -hmm. like I got <laughs> yeah uh, well they're important <laughs> signals and that we, we, we get them for a reason I guess right um, yeah, yeah. Pri prior to going to Everest the first time how did you what was the process of getting yourself mentally and physically healthy again I actually um, focused on my nutrition and also learning to rest and sleep enough because mm -hmm having that problem in sleeping was the toughest thing to get healthy from and and physically i had to think differently and also to balance when i worked out i had to rest afterwards we know the top athletes do it but most of us we don't you know <laughs> so so i've now learned to listen what what do my body really need and give it that you're you're clear and, and also you're clearly the and kind also of the, person, sorry to interrupt, you're clearly the kind of person who likes to push yourself. You pushed yourself too much in work, and then you, in turn, started to push yourself too much in getting healthy. Um, getting sleep, getting rest days between workouts, as you said, incredibly important. And for a, mm -hmm. a person with a personality like you, that might be a tough lesson to learn, I guess. Well, uh, I think the, one of the toughest things was because my family and everything, I haven't been used to laying around on my sofa, you know, because we, we don't do that. <laughs> so to learn, you know, when I, I was sick to just do nothing, that was tough. That was a mental challenge for me. Mm. But today I 
really enjoy that like being here and now to do meditate and all these things you know so so i've changed a lot due to this and i'd say i wouldn't wish this experience on anybody but i i'm really happy it happened to me because yeah. um it made me the person i am today and it made me change my life in so many ways that i probably would never have done at least not at this time yeah, you had to be pushed to an extreme to start to make those changes and be aware of those important things, right? Well, that's, yeah. great. that's great that you sorted that out. Uh, let's get back to your um, Everest summit. Um, so you mm -hmm. returned to Everest. So the first um, expedition was canceled due to the earthquake. Um, at some point you returned. So could you talk about that, please? Yeah, because when we decided to cancel, I immediately actually decided to come back the next year. I didn't tell my team that because it was certainly not the time and a place to discuss it. Uh, and, and it was a big challenge, you know, because experienced the earthquake, I, I also wanted to help the people in Nepal. So I, I, I did a lot of work to raise some funds and send them money because I found out that was the best way that I could support. Uh, and then to also fund the whole expedition again, but I did it. And, and I organized everything myself with a local company doing the logistics. So I, would, I wasn't part of a big team. And, and I also <laughs> decided I was going to do both Everest and Lutze because they are basically neighbor mountains. And up until 7,800, it's the same climb. Hmm. Oh, I so think I've already... one is a right turn, one is a left turn or something like that, right? Yeah. It yeah. is, and I heard about uh, a guy that I know. He's he did Everest, and then he went up lots and then down. So I was thinking, oh, I I'm gonna try the same, you know. Wow. <laughs> and and then uh, the first three weeks, me and my climbing Sherpa did the acclimatizing together, and we were going in the Kumbu Valley. It was such an amazing experience because it it was this spring and. Rhododendrons were flowering and the local people were planting their vegetable gardens and it was really wonderful, you know, acclimatizing and going in there. And then when you come to base camp, then the most dangerous part of the climb from the police side is between base camp and camp one. It's what's called the Kumbu Icefall, where you have massive crevices. Uh, some of them are hundreds of meters deep and many meters wide uh, so we use ladders to cross them and when i was there the longest ladder was five ladders that were tied together with a rope yeah so you we were climbing up like an ice block that was maybe like a three four story house and for me that used to be afraid of heights you know it was just to achieve coming through there not only once but several times that was in itself a uh, achievement because it is scary to cross these ladders when you are on crampons, you know? For anybody who's listening to this or watching this who's not familiar with that, I would suggest go to YouTube or whatever and search for the ice, uh, what, what is it called? The ice Kumbu falls? Ice fall? The ice falls, yeah. I've seen it. Yeah, and it, Everest. Looks, uh, it looks utterly terrifying. That looks scarier than any other aspect of, of mountain climbing to me because it's constantly shifting and moving and there's just massive gaps in the ice. And like you said, you're using these rickety ladders to go across and then you have what, crampons on your feet as well, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. Yeah, so and it's, uh, it is, uh, every day is different. I think the ice fall is moving between 60 centimeter and one meter in 24 hours. Do you, do you happen to know offhand, like uh, what percentage of people obviously lose their lives on Mount Everest? What percentage of them lose their lives in that area? Do you know? I, I don't remember exactly, but I think somewhere in the realms of maybe 4% or something like that. Mm -hmm. So not, not, not a huge amount, but it's still a very scary place, even for an experienced climber like you, I'm sure. Yeah, it is because I think anybody who's going to climb a uh, 8,000 meter peak, um, you need to think about the fact that nobody can rescue you and um, you might not come home. So the question is, do you still want to go? 
Well, okay, so eventually you made it past the ice falls. And well, yeah. I guess it, maybe for people who don't know, you don't just go through there one time. I think you mentioned it a second no. ago. You go up and down and up and down to acclimatize, is that correct? Yeah, for our, our body to adjust to the high altitude, we, we basically climb the mountain several times because we go up to altitude that we have not been to yet. And then we go down for the body to rest a bit and then we go up again. So, so basically my rotations was that I started in base camp, went up to camp one and camp two. Then I came back to base camp again, up to camp one, camp two, camp three, back to base camp. And having slept in camp three, I got this kumbu cough, which is a cough that you get because of its extremely cold and extremely dry air. So your lungs get a bit annoyed or irritated, you could say. So in base camp, it's 5,400 meters. Your body will not really restitute and recover from anything. So I hiked four, 40 kilometers down the valley, down to altitude of 4,300 meters to just for, let my body, you know, rest a bit. And then wow. back up to base camp again. How long did you have to and rest? I think I took two, three nights there. Oh, not long. So then coming back to base camp, I wanted to have a rest day, but you know, then the weather forecast was good. So ready or not, here we go, summit push. Uh, and then as we came to camp two, there was so strong winds on the forecast that we stayed there. And to give you a picture of those winds, uh, it was 60 knots, which is like, more than 100 kilometers an hour winds. Strong winds. You, wind, you yeah. cannot be on the summit on a day like that of because course. it can basically blow you off. Yeah. <laughs> and then from there, we, we started uh, our summit push. And as we left Camp Tree, then we are at 7,300 meters. I wanted to like do all the tiny details, practice them for the final night. And, and one of the things we have to make sure to take care of is to clean our oxygen mask because it's cold on the outside and we're breathing out hot air. So it can freeze up. So mm -hmm. I was thinking I'm gonna learn to do this properly because I had a new type of oxygen mask that I never used before. And the Sherpa was gonna show me and then it's like, ding, this tiny valve fell off. So we agreed, okay, he's gonna put it in his pocket and we're gonna fix this when we come to camp four. A piece of your oxygen mask came off. A, a piece yeah. of the, the part that goes it's on your It's a tiny valve of it only. A valve. So it was, yeah, so it was basically still functioning, but not 100%. Uh, and then in camp four, it was like the tiny piece was missing. So we're like, okay, I had thankfully a spare mask with us. So we decided uh, I was just going to use that one. And we just filled up with as much, much food and energy that we could and then rested for a couple of hours. And then at nine in the evening, we started the summit push for the summit. And it was this beautiful evening where it was cold, but no winds. And we could see the stars and sense the contours of the peak we were heading up. Uh, so I was, I was feeling strong and extremely excited as we started out from there. And then about one hour into our climb, we reached a Japanese expedition that was in front of us. And they basically stopped all of us because they were walking so extremely slow. And at times we were standing completely still because when you climb up there, there is like only one rope that we all are attached to for safety. And this group, they, they didn't let anybody pass them. Can, and when you're, can you physically pass people at that point? Is it possible? Well, you put yourself at risk because if you click yourself off the, off the rope and, and go, if you do a tiny mistake, you might slide down the whole mountainside. So you don't want to do that. Yeah. So, so, you know, when you're in 30 minus Celsius and it's extremely cold to stand still. And also your extremities, they have a very bad blood circulation because of the lack of oxygen. 
So it's so easy to get frost bites and damage to your fingers and stuff. So I was focusing on, you know, keeping them warm. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, we moved up and because I was supposed to climb Lutza and we had all this time, you know, waiting, I was like looking around and I could really see people climbing Lutza. You could see their headlights, you know? Uh -huh. So I felt so happy, even though it was like really cold and dark and things were not moving ahead as planned. But the moment was so extremely intense and I could really feel like the expansiveness of the nature as we were standing there. So, so it was a fantastic experience. And then, you know, early morning, the sun is coming up. And, and you know, the hour before the sun is coming up on any mountain, it's extremely cold, much colder than the rest of the night. So when you see that tiny strip, it's like a orange yellow and it's growing, growing when the sun is coming. It's like, oh, thank you, thank you, the sun is coming because you know it's gonna get warm and so that was amazing feeling uh, but the thing was that I had to put on my googles because you have to protect your eyes and that was the moment where I actually realized that my oxygen mask was leaking it was condensed coming from my mask into my googles so my googles was fogging up on the inside and because of the cold air it froze so I had to like take off, get off the fog, put you them on, on and off. You couldn't see at all? Not when they fogged up because then uh -huh. it's kind of, and then it freezes. So it's like ice, you know? <laughs> so then I had to fix that and on and off with the glasses. And, and normally you never take off your glasses in that altitude. But I had to because I need to clean my, my Googles. And then, you know, some parts here are extremely narrow and it's on one side you have 2500 meters down and then the tibetan side it's 3000 meters down so you can't really do much mistakes here and as i was reaching the south summit i had a small break and when i was continuing then i, I realized i couldn't see the contours of the snow and you know, I was like, oh, this is not good, but I still felt really strong and felt like the summit was in reach. So I didn't really think too much about it. You, you, know? said, you, were, you said you were at the south summit. So there's a south, south. summit, and the, the, the actual summit, I suppose, correct? Yeah, it's what about is... 100 meters higher. Uh -huh. So, but it's at that halt, altitude, it really takes you quite a long time to, to yeah. do the final hundred meters uh, but as I came to the summit you know it it was this fantastic view because it was a blue sky it was sunshine and you can see that all the peaks both in the Tibetan side and in the police side the other high peaks etc so it was a beautiful moment and we could take our pictures but as I was sitting there my my vision was really getting worse and worse well can I can I and I can I interrupt you for just yeah. a second? <clears throat> Let's go back to that beautiful moment before we get to the difficult stuff. Uh, you achieved it. You, you set foot on the top of Mount Everest, which not many people in the history of the world have done that. Um, what was that like for you as a climber, as somebody who had, you know, you're an ambitious person and you put your mind to it and you planned this and you, you funded the expedition. Finally, you're up there after all these challenges. What was that moment like for you? Was it, was it just so exhilarating for you? I mean, do you remember what it was like up there? It, it was this, in, it, I had this incredibly great feeling and it, it was, but the, the moment was definitely muted by the fact that I didn't see well. Yeah. I think that if my vision would have been perfect, it would have been incredible. It, for because somebody for somebody who climbs high mountains um, and you often reach these different summits, is Everest different? Is it a different thing when you get up there? Or is it just, you know, a, a similar feeling to reaching other summits? 
it's like you feel like you're on cloud nine if i could say that yeah. <laughs> you know you can I mean, all, higher, you higher, almost higher feel like you can fly home <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> so, so it's it's a little bit like that <laughs> That's beautiful. Almost like when you're in love, you know, you're like, ooh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, okay, well, let's, let's, let's continue the story. So when you were actually at the summit, is that the first time that you noticed so something off about your vision? No, at the South Summit, I, I right. realized I couldn't see the contours, but the 20 minutes we were sitting on the summits before we started our return, mm -hmm. it became extremely worse. So when I was, you know, getting ready to go, I was like, oh my goodness, I, I can't really see well. Was it, was uh, it and blurry or how, how would you describe it? You know, when you get suntan lotion in your eyes. <laughs> it's very specific. It's, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's a uh, it's li little bit blurry kind of and it can get a little bit white, cloudy, mm -hmm. kind yeah. of like that. Uh -huh. and, and I had actually planned to call home from the summit but uh, you don't call home and say, hi, mom, I'm on a summit of Everest, but I don't see much, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so I canceled that phone call. <laughs> but when we were starting to climb there, I, I uh, said to my climbing sheriff, well, hey, I don't see much. And he's like, see, don't worry, we're going to get you down. So we agreed he was going to climb in front of me, and I just tried and focused on like following each of the steps he did looking at his feet and his back you know so i had like focus on that but already down at the south summit i was totally blind i couldn't see anything everything was white and i was like now we have a problem and that's you know? a lot you have a long way to go and even if you're at the south summit that's not a safe place it's not it doesn't get easier you still have to go through the ice falls and all of those challenges and everything is just completely white yes yeah you you are at the time at 8700 meters and camp 4 is at 79 so you, so you basically had 900 altitude meters to get down basically and um because I was supposed to climb Lutze, I had asked to have one extra Sherpa because I normally would have one guy with me. This guy was supposed to wait in camp four so we could, he could be fresh and we could climb Lutze after Everest. At the time when we summit, started the summit push, I didn't think about it, but he actually followed us up to the summit of Everest, which at the time was my lucky day because normally it would be me and one guy. Mm. Now I had two guys. So we made this, you know, we discussed how we're gonna do this and blah, blah, blah. And we had one guy that climbed first and then we had me and then we had the other guy behind me. So they were helping me with the ropes because when we were gonna do rappels, I couldn't see the ropes and fix them. So one guy rappelled down, the other oh, guy I fixed my rope. I wanna interrupt you for a second, I'm sorry. Um, you're a very experienced climber. Um, you don't seem like you're scared of too many things, I don't think. Um, but you have a lot of experience in, in climbing high mountains. However, yeah. this is a very unique situation that I don't think you've ever experienced something like that before. No. I think most people would become pretty terrified at that point. People lose their lives in that area of Mount Everest. Um, yeah. What was going through your mind? I know you're kind of probably planning everything and, and discussing with your team how you're going to yeah. do it. How are you feeling inside? Was, was fear overtaking you or were you calm and focused on the task? No. Yeah, I, you know, I know that if you don't do the right things, you're going to be there. You're going to stay there for the rest of your life, basically. It's not going to stay long, <laughs> be long. Um, so for me, to die there on the mountain that was not an option i even considered uh, i focused my mind 100 percent on the task on how are going to solve this and yeah i was afraid but i didn't let the fear overtake because i put my focus on solving it and and also on some level i thought it's going to be like it's supposed to be so I had that kind of feeling knowing inside that 
it's going to work out. So because I had that, uh, you know, I focused with my team and it became, I call it like the World Cup in teamwork, communication, and also trust and hope. Because I had to trust these guys with my life, basically, that they were going to help me. Because on my own, without them, I could never have made it down. And, and probably so, would be just one share, but you couldn't have done it. It would have been much more challenging. Absolutely. Because even with the two of us, it took forever to climb down. I, I don't know, but maybe we took three, four times the, the time it normally would take us to come down. So how long would that be? And, well, basically, we worked our way down the mountain and and we arrived camp for 36 hours after we left camp three. So at the time we had been climbing 32 hours and, and um, 12 and a half of those have been blind. That's, that's probably- But going up, we, we went like, much much longer we only went down to camp four on the way back because that's the first place we had our tents and where we could really rest when you um, finally when you finally arrived at camp four um i'm guessing that you were out longer than you should have been and most likely people were concerned were they aware yeah. that you were were there people at camp four that were aware that you were out much longer than you should have been I don't think in camp four, maybe, maybe not. I, we, we talked to a couple of expeditions that was passing us on our way down, so they probably knew. But we had um, walkie-talkie contact with base camp because wow. we had a guy sitting there. And, and of course, my friends and family knew I went for, for the summit push. I normally would have called home or sent a message from the summit, but due to the circumstances, I never did. Mm -hmm. And then when I arrived in camp four, I couldn't see the phone. I couldn't call. So I asked my sheriff, you know, can you get out the satellite phone? Can we? And then I was realizing it's not those touch phones, it's those old ones with the menus. Uh -huh. And his English is a bit so so. So I was, and I couldn't remember the menus. So I couldn't tell him what to push or click. Mm. So I was like, mm, nah, let's call tomorrow. <laughs> you know, let's go to sleep. Because we, so I guess uh, one of them, we walked it, it down to base camp and told them, but we weren't able to contact my people to tell them. You know, so I, afterwards I learned that a lot of people was worried why they didn't hear anything, if I did summit or what was going on and all that, you know. Hmm. Well, when you got back to camp four, did your, did your condition improve? Did your eyes improve? Yeah, actually after 24 hours or 24 hours after, after I lost my vision, I got it back. And, and at the time on the mountain, as, and as we were going down, I thought it was snow blindness because I had taken my glasses off all the time. I had basically forgotten that I had bought contacts with UV filter, which physically makes it impossible to be snow blind. Uh, so what happened was that I got an edema on my cornea because the eyes is the organ in the body that is mostly sensitive to lack of oxygen. So I think lack of oxygen, the condensation inside my Googles, but also what I have learned later from a lady that is know a lot of Chinese medicine is that, you know, stress is affecting our body a lot. And uh, you know how the different organs are connected. So the eyes are connected to the liver and the liver is the organ in the body that is mostly affected from stress. So basically that I had overworked myself a couple of years earlier probably made me more open to having this problem on the mountain at the time. So it's kind of crazy when you think about it, but uh, it also made sense. Uh, so we stayed one extra day there in camp four to try to make my vision come back as much as possible. And then we, I canceled, of course, lots of plans and we climbed all the way to camp to the no, base camp. So, so two days later, I could like stay in base camp and say, yeah, 
I made it back safe, you know. <laughs> then you could finally celebrate. Yeah. Is that, a, is that a common occurrence that people lose their vision at high altitude like that? No. Yeah. There is uh, something that's called the Himalayan database. They keep track of everybody that is climbing the 8,000 meters in Nepal. And, and I talked to them and, and they didn't have records of anybody having this problem. Really? So. Just, well, then you might be exactly right. It might be linked to, to your stressful lifestyle. And was it painful? Was there any pain or was no, you... no, no pain. Well, and you're lucky. And it was just uh, like this white fog that got total. <laughs> and it couldn't have and, happened and at a worse time. <laughs> it couldn't. And, and the thing was that I talked to a doctor that is specialized in altitude medicine. And he said to me, you've been extremely lucky because um, if this kind of sets, it can become permanent. So I was like, ooh. Any, any ongoing yeah. issues now, today, related no, to that? No, no. And, and he said to me, you know, just be careful in the future. It does, it probably it's not going to happen again, but make sure you not only wear contacts, have some glasses that you can, you know, wear as an alternative. So I've tried, I started with like trying, okay, let me try Kilimanjaro. Yeah, that was fine. Then I did a 6,000 meter that, that was, was after, after Everest, you went back to Kilimanjaro. Yeah, so, so now I climbed, I don't know, four, five, six thousand meters after and two of them almost seven thousand. So I'm confident I'm good again. <laughs> Any ambitions to return to, what's, what's the, the second route that you didn't take? I forget. To Lutze? Sorry? To Lutze, the neighbor mountain? Yeah. Any ambitions to return there? I, I could probably do that or probably will do that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you well. I hope your eyes, I hope your eyes hold up that time. Um, Thank you. Okay. Uh, that's a fascinating story. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, <laughs> did you find it difficult over the years to balance your passion for climbing with your busy career? When I was in corporate, it was always a challenge because, um, you know, they don't want to give you four to six, seven, eight weeks off. Uh -huh. Uh, so it was always like, yeah, this is the last time or <laughs> something like that, you know. But uh, I managed up until that that last job there to to make it happen because I think if you plan things and work together, there's always solutions to be made. And then um, after I left that job, I actually started for myself. So yes. now I'm the boss. <laughs> you don't have to ask for permission if you want to go somewhere. Uh, well, I yeah. want to talk to you. I want to talk to you actually about what you're doing now. So, as you mentioned, you worked in various roles around the world with Fortune 500 companies. Um, you are now the founder and CEO at Aim Lofty, a fitting title. Um, what is Aim Lofty, and what are your goals with your company? Well, it's it's the company I started, and I think my mission is to inspire you to be the best version of yourself. And, and I want to help people to stop playing small and, and to start going for their dreams. Because I myself, I love challenges and, and reaching tough goals, but also to help other people reach their goals. And, and I'd say my message is that anything is possible if you believe you can, and, and you are so much stronger than you think you are, and you can actually be, do, and have much more than you believe is possible. So... So I want to help people with that, to, to set some goals and make good plans and make things happen. That's fantastic. And one part of what you're doing at Aim Lofty is um, taking people on adventures, uh, taking people mm -hmm. who may need, as you put it, a jump start in life to join you on an expedition. I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, could you share a story of one or more memorable expeditions and how it might have motivated, inspired, or changed uh, a person who was on the journey with you? Yeah. Um, when I was in Everest in, uh, on Everest in 2016, I realized a lot of them, Sherpas and the people in the valley, they hadn't had work for a year because of the earthquake. No tourists were yeah. there. So I organized a group uh, to go three weeks tracking the following year to, to give some of them some work. 
And a friend of mine, she said, well, I have a friend that wants to go. So I was thinking, oh, you know, she's a mountain girl. So I, I basically assumed her friend was a mountain girl as well. And, and this girl, she, she had prepared for the trip by, you know, doing some tracking preparations and everything. But when we came to Nepal, I was so surprised to learn that this girl didn't have much mountain experience. The trip was basically a tracking trip, so it wasn't really a problem. But she's been like a ballet dancer and done, you know, she was physically strong, but she didn't have the balance in the uneven terrain. So that was like, ooh. <laughs> and she never slept in the cold in a tent. And, you know, during the trip, she kept surprising me how she like stepped up to this challenge and to doing new things. She was like totally outside her comfort zone and basically expanded her own comfort zone, both on the track, but also, you know, sleeping in the cold, uh, in tent and all of that. And, and what I found so inspiring is that she enjoyed it so much. She, she asked me, see, can you organize a trip? Because I want to take my two girls who are in the 20s for a trip with you. So we're going to do that next year. So that is really inspiring for me, you know? It changed her and she wants to pass that along as well. That's fantastic. Um, yeah. So you have had some incredible achievements in your life, not just mountain climbing, of course. And with your great energy and positive attitude, you're undoubtedly a great inspiration to many people. But I wanna know who is inspiring to you? Who is someone, anyone on earth, that is still giving you great inspiration? I have so many people who inspire me. So I basically probably have different people for different area. Uh, I have an Icelandic lady called Alpha that uh, inspiring me to take care of my body with uh, juicing, detoxing a couple of times each year. I, I also work with a network marketing business. So I have a lady in, from Norway called Hege with her, how she do the business and personal development. You know, I have... Um, a personal trainer that inspired me to just give it all. <laughs> but I have also, like this winter, you had uh, Mike Horn and uh, Birge Auslan. They crossed the Antarctic Ocean, North Pole during the winter. That is like a feat that never, nobody never have done. And you also have the Nepali girl, guy called Nims who completed all the 14, 8,000 meters like in one year something that nobody have done before. So these people are really, really inspiring. But I also have to say like everybody that is wanting to do a change and really step up to do something, if I can help somebody do something they really want, that is so inspiring, you know? Absolutely, I love that answer. Um, let's see, finally, I'd like to know, What's next for you? Obviously, we're talking during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, so things are a bit weird. Travel is a bit difficult at the moment, if not impossible for some people. Um, are there any more mountains to climb or great adventures, personal or professional, in your future? There are so many things. <laughs> you know that I am planning to do North Pole and South Pole, which is called the Grand Slam to do Explore, explore Loris Grand Slam to do seven summits and the pole. And only 69 people have done so yet. So yeah. that is inspiring. Uh, but as I was finishing the seven summit, uh, a guy told me, have you heard about the seven volcanoes? And I was like, what? <laughs> and first I thought it was lame. And then I was like, it kind of, the seed was growing, you know? So right now I've done five after those seven volcanoes as well, which is the highest volcano on each continent. And today it's only 25 people who've done that, or it's less than that actually. Uh, what's, 14. What's, what's the major difference between climbing a volcano and climbing a high mountain? What do you think? It's not really that different. So it's more like it's another challenge and, and a couple of them are difficult to access. Mm -hmm. Like for instance, uh, the one volcano that is the highest in Antarctica is probably the, the mountain volcano in the world that is most hard to access. 
Absolutely, yeah. It's 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 only it's less than people in fifty people in the world who who's been there at all, and and it's totally. I think 14 people that have done seven summits that's also done the seven volcano. So it's a tiny group. So, so I, I've decided I want to be the first person in the world to complete seven summits, seven volcanoes and the two poles. And for me, it's, it's a mission to inspire you guys to be the best you, you know? Yeah. And, and as I was working on this and I met up with a friend during the pandemic here and his goal was also seven summits and both of us have the same experience, you know? Our projects stopped, our income stopped, and, and both of us, we come from very different backgrounds, and we found like the two poles was bringing us together, because we both want to do it. So we agreed that we're gonna join forces and, and think bigger, can we complete it all the next year? So we really want to show people that it's possible to think big, and go for your dreams no matter your situations. That's so fantastic. so right, think... right now we're like in the process of finding out how we can achieve it. Can we find some partner to join us? Can we do some projects together with somebody as a part of this? So maybe some sponsors, you know. So, so it's, it's exciting times for us to see what we can do. So just one more time, it's the first, are you, you, you want to be the first person to do seven summits both poles, seven volcanoes, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Not the first Norwegian woman, the first person. That's yeah. an incredible challenge, that's an incredible challenge, and I, I have no reason to think that you won't achieve it. Um, Steve, you're a remarkable person and a great inspiration. I've really enjoyed talking with you. Uh, thank you for your time and joining me on Meet My Inspiration. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to be here with you. My thanks to C for sharing her amazing story and for being such a great and inspiring person. If you want to find out more about Sieve and keep up on her activities, you can find her on Instagram at Sieve Harstad and go to her website, aimlofty.com. Should anyone be interested in partnering with her or sponsoring her journey, just click the Get In Touch link right on her homepage. You can also hear more about her Everest Summit in her TED Talk, available on YouTube. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Meet My Inspiration, and I hope we've been able to inspire you too, even if just a little. Sometimes that's all it takes to make great things happen. Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like broadcasting to the world everything you do online. Here's how to protect yourself and get three months for free. Did you know that your internet service provider knows every single website you visit? And what's worse is they can sell this information to ad companies and tech giants who will use your data to target you. ExpressVPN creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so that your online activity can't be seen by anyone. ExpressVPN works on all devices, phones, laptops, even routers, so that everyone who shares your Wi-Fi is protected too. And the best part is using ExpressVPN is super easy. Just fire up the app, click one button, and you're protected. ExpressVPN is the world's number one rated VPN by TechRadar, Wired, The Verge, and countless others. So if you believe your online activity is your business, secure yourself by visiting expressvpn.com MMI, and you can get an extra three months for free. That's expressvpn.com MMI.